Well, I've got a little bit of a dilemma, not a big one, but I'd like to get some feedback from any of you who might be watching this video as to your opinion in terms of whether or not you think I should do a podcast. I've been asked by a person who watches my videos to consider doing one. Um, he thinks that it would be helpful if it had content related to Pure Land Buddhism. And if I did a podcast, I would probably label it Exploring Pure Land Buddhism. Now, anybody who's watched a bunch of my videos would know that um, while I do consider myself an Orthodox Shin Buddhist along the lines of the teachings of Shinran and Renyo, in terms of my own belief system, I don't restrict myself to those Orthodox uh, topics and themes in the context of my YouTube videos because I'm a, a strong believer also in the Lotus Sutra when it talks about the use of expedient means and the fact that different ones of us um, have different needs in terms of, you know, what causes us to resonate with the Dharma or with religion in general. So uh, in that sense, uh, if I were to do a podcast on Pure Land, um, you know, it might have appealed to some and, and others might frankly get turned off by it, but uh, I guess that's in the nature of, of the thing. But my, my real uh, bases for uh, the, the dilemma are, I guess, number one, just technical, that I don't know really how to do a podcast in terms of, you know, uploading something and getting it accessible to people. But again, that would be a learning curve and something I could figure out. And the second thing is, what kind of content would I fill it with? What, what would I say? Now, you know, when I get in front of the camera for these YouTube videos, I generally am able to spout off a fair amount. But that's different than creating, say, a 15 or 20 minute um, podcast of um, verbalizations in the context of an audio clip. But anyhow, I did one on an experimental basis, and I'm going to play it uh, in the context of this particular video. And so if you have any opinion, you know, make a comment and tell me what you think. And um, I'll be grateful for that. Thank you. Welcome. I am a lay Shin Buddhist who nevertheless maintains an interest in the broader realm of Pure Land and Mahayana Buddhist teachings. My YouTube channel is called Akala Akala, that is A-C-A-L-A, A-C-A-L-A. -A -A. In these podcasts, I make a non-scholarly, humble, and sometimes bumbling attempt to explore a particular topic or question related to the wonderful Buddha Dharma. I hope you find them to be of interest. With that said, let us begin. So I have been asked by someone who apparently listens to the YouTube videos on my Akala Akala channel. I have been asked to do a podcast. And to tell you the truth, I know from nothing about podcasts other than the fact that I listen to some of them and really enjoy them. But I really pondered, well, what would I have to say on a podcast? What do I, as a lay Buddhist, have to offer that anyone might want to listen to? Well, I probably personally don't have much of value that would come out of my own head, but, you know, there are others whose perspectives I might want to share and highlight. For example, in the very first YouTube videos that I uploaded, my focus was on Shin Buddhist faith, and what I was focusing on in particular were a series of articles of profession of faith by the Reverend Takashi Tsuji, who was a mentor of mine in the early years of my conversion to True Pure Land Buddhism, or Jodo Shinshu. So anyhow, those videos, the first three of them, were back in November of 2010, and I basically recited these uh, elements of the profession of faith. And so what I'd want to do is maybe uh, share some of those with you here and reflect upon the meaning of some of them. But before I get into that, maybe a word of biography regarding the Reverend Ken Ryu T. Tsuji is indicated. He died at age 84 in 2004 and really led an incredible life. Uh, he was the first U.S. citizen to serve as bishop of the 105-year-old Buddhist Churches of America, the largest Buddhist group in the Japanese-American community. And the information I'm sharing with you now comes from the Washington Post article that was published when he died. 
Reverend Suji survived life in a World War II internment camp. He launched several Buddhist congregations and published an introduction to Buddhism on the Internet. He started congregations in Canada and California, and in 1981, at an age when many others would have retired, he moved to Virginia and organized the first Shin Buddhist temple in the southeastern United States, Ikoji Buddhist Temple in Springfield. He also helped establish a Buddhist center in Richmond, Virginia, that is used by several small communities. The Ikoji Congregation built a full-fledged temple in Fairfax Station in 1999, and after that, Mr. Tsuji actually retired. So, going back to some of my own recollections uh, early in my uh, exposure and conversion to Buddhism back in 1979, shortly thereafter, I was doing various and sundry things to help uh, propagate the Buddha Dharma, and I don't recall exactly what it was that I was up to that that caught Reverend Suji's attention. Uh, maybe it was the newsletter that we developed, uh, me and some cohorts across the country called the Wider Shin Buddhist Fellowship. In any case, we connected, he made contact, and he actually visited me three or four times in the little rural community that I lived in in western North Carolina. He invited me up at one point to the Ikoji Temple to engage in a Sarana Affirmation Ceremony which was basically uh, a ceremony sort of affirming my, uh, my faith in uh, Shin Buddhism and my reliance upon Amida Buddha uh, as my savior. My name, he gave me a name, they did at the time. Actually, it was Bishop Yamaoka who conducted the ceremony. Uh, my name was Daigyo, which is great practice. And of course, the great practice in uh, Pure Land Buddhism is saying the name, saying the Nembutsu, reciting Namu Amida Butsu, Namu Amida Butsu, I take refuge in Amida Buddha. In any case, later, Reverend Suji actually sponsored me to go to California in 1991 to attend an annual meeting of the Buddhist Churches of America, and there I was able to give a report on the progress of our wider Shin Buddhist fellowship. Going back to his biography and looking back into his early life, Bishop Tsuji was born in Mission City, British Columbia, and graduated from the University of British Columbia. He attended Ryokoku University in Kyoto, Japan, as part of his effort to enter the Shin Buddhist ministry. He earned, parenthetically, a black belt in Judo, and received religious ordination from the Nishi Hungwanji sect just before the start of World War II. And for those of you who don't know, uh, it's interesting, to my mind, how, you know, religions tend to split even when there's uh, essentially no fundamental difference in ideology or doctrine. Uh, and in this case, Shin Buddhism, which uh, if I continue on with these podcasts, I'll uh, say more about to the extent of my limited knowledge of the history of, uh, of Shin Buddhism. But uh, the point here being that the, uh, uh, the Shin Buddhist tradition, the true Pure Land Buddhist tradition, split into two, uh, into two factions, sort of the Western and the Eastern uh, and so uh, one of them was this uh, Nishi Hangwanji sect. I think the headquarters for both of them is in Kyoto, Japan, which, uh, frankly, I would love to, to visit, although I don't, um, I'm not real keen on travel. And so I, I don't know that I'll ever get there, being now uh, me being 71 years of age and kind of a, uh, an old fogey as the, the haiku goes. In any case, Reverend Suji was urged by his school teachers to leave Japan just before World War II began. He returned to Canada on what turned out to be the last boat. He was appointed to the minister of Hampa Buddhist Temple in Vancouver, British Columbia. However, like all Canadians of Japanese ancestry who lived on the West Coast, in October 1942 he was forced into an internment camp. The 23-year-old Bishop Tsuji was sent to the camp at Slocan, British Columbia, where he was appointed principal of Bay Farm Elementary School. The 25 teacher internees there instructed the 500 children in the camp. And by the way, uh, I think uh, his father had to give up a 35-acre uh, a berry farm uh, when he was interned, and in 1945, after the camp was closed, Bishop Tsuji was unable to reclaim his father's farm, so he settled in Toronto. He worked on a mushroom farm, 
washed dishes, and worked in a chemical factory to support himself. Kind of reminds me of the Zen stories of enlightenment where they talk about uh, before enlightenment, the, uh, the Zen monk uh, sort of, uh, whatever you want to say, washed dishes and cleaned the toilets. And then after enlightenment, he washed dishes and cleaned the toilets. Uh, so really, these were the everyday mundane things that in this case, Reverend Suji had to do just simply in order to survive. But as other Japanese Canadians moved to Toronto, he and others formed an organization that became the Toronto Buddhist Church, the largest Buddhist congregation in Canada. The next year he formed Hamilton Buddhist Church and later Montreal Buddhist Church. The Toronto members built their own formal temple in 1955 with Bishop Tsuji as resident minister. In 1955, he edited the first program of studies for Buddhist Sunday schools, which came to be used by most such schools in North America. He created the first English format for infant presentations and adult affirmations and a new marriage service as well. Bishop Tsuji was appointed National Director of Buddhist Education for Buddhist Churches of America in 1958 and moved to San Francisco. And I believe that was the context in which he wrote this profession of faith that it, at some point I'll get to. No, I'm wrong on that. Actually, on the back of this uh, small pamphlet, it says that this was published by Eastern Canada Buddhist Publications uh, in Toronto. And so um, this was actually uh, a precursor to his formal involvement in the uh, educational programs of the Buddhist Churches of America. I believe it's the case that that Nishi Hangwanji sect that I mentioned, uh, it actually breaks down as an organization into several subgroups across the world, really. Uh, but in the case of uh, our particular uh, sort of <laughs> sort of realm within the world, if you will, um, we have the Buddhist churches of America, which obviously are are those that exist within the, uh, the United States. And then you had the Buddhist churches of Canada. I believe also that the Buddhist churches of Hawaii were yet a third uh, separate organization or sub-organization, all relating back to the Hangwanji Temple. One of the other things Reverend Suji did when he went to San Francisco was he organized the Buddhist bookstore. And I have to tell you, I've really... Uh, relied on them many a time over the years to obtain uh, publications of interest because, you know, just as the person who asked me to do this podcast said, hey, you know, there aren't that many podcasts on Pure Land Buddhism. Well, it, it was also the case for many years, many decades, that there just weren't that many publications regarding Pure Land Buddhism in your ordinary uh, corner bookstore. And so, you know, the, the Buddhist bookstore has been a real resource for people uh, across the country and around the world to be able to get uh, texts of the relevant uh, doctrinal and commentary type uh, texts uh, within our tradition. He was also the person who introduced the popular district conferences and seminars, which again reflects his tremendous wish to promulgate the teaching, to turn the great Dharma wheel, as I would say, uh, and again, to emphasize outreach. Frankly, a lot of the folks within the Buddhist churches of America, I don't want to necessarily say a lot, but many of them, and the organization as a whole, during the era when I first uh, became a Buddhist back in the uh, you know late 70s, early 80s, um, all due respect, they weren't necessarily all that receptive uh, to what they, I think, refer to as as, as converts. Um, you know, why? Well, you know, after having been interned, uh, you know, so unfairly during World War II, having their material uh, possessions confiscated and in many cases or most never given back, um, the Buddhist churches there, the temples, really became kind of a refuge uh, or a source of um, sort of social activity and community within the Japanese American community. And so, you know, one can hardly begrudge them for, you know, wanting to maintain that uh, in, in its uh, integrity relative to um, sort of the involvement, if you will, of, uh, of us outsiders. Uh, but there were many of us outsiders, many people across the country who in one way or another came across 
uh, Pure Land Buddhism or Shin Buddhism and said, uh, you know, this, this faith, this entrustment, this belief in a vow, a vow of such profundity that was committed to by this cosmic bodhisattva dharmakara back uh, many eons ago that uh, that he would not become a Buddha unless he could create a, a place, a place in the universe where uh, any of us who had faith in him, who entrusted in the power of his vow, could be reborn uh, when we die. What a source of comfort for us. And again, people across the country got turned on to this and realized that um, this was a path that uh, was an easy path. It was an easy path that didn't require tremendous conformity to precepts and, and rituals. And uh, this was just a very welcome kind of sort of new approach that could satisfy our spiritual needs and lead us to a more fulfilling life. Anyhow, back to Reverend Suji. Um, he became a U.S. citizen around 1965, and in 68, he was elected Bishop of the National Buddhist Churches of America and became President of the Institute of Buddhist Studies in Berkeley. He became a film director and producer and created several Buddhist films. He also presided over the 75th anniversary of Buddhist Churches of America in 1974, a celebration attended by thousands of Shin Buddhists from around the world. Speaking of the Institute of Buddhist Studies, um, <laughs> I often thought uh, if I were a younger man, you know, I would want to pursue, if I had the insight and awareness about Shin Buddhism, that I would want to pursue uh, becoming a Shin uh, priest. They call them um, ministers. Um, but of course, I had already carved out a path within the field of clinical psychology. And, um, and in any case, in the early days, um, back when I was uh, initially focused on uh, true Pure Land Buddhism, uh, I knew some people who went to the Institute of Buddhist Studies, and I was well aware that in order to graduate, um, you had to go to Japan and spend time there, which that in itself uh, would not have been aversive or problematic, but you pretty much had to learn Japanese language, I believe, and that would have been a huge obstacle for me uh, in any case. Well, I'll just mention finally that uh, Reverend Suji or Bishop Suji was the first Buddhist to be president of the U.S. affiliate of the World Conference on Religion and Peace, serving from 83 to 89. He was a guest at an interfaith breakfast at the White House with President Bill Clinton in 93, and he retired in the fall of 99 and was named Buddhist Churches of America Minister Emeritus and moved to Foster City, California. Well, I guess in spite of my reluctance to do a podcast, I've been blabbering on here for quite a while, and again would uh, reference and remind you that in my first three uh, videos that I ever produced back in November 2010, I called them Shin Buddhist Faith, and I think I may have called them something like Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3, because I broke it up into these three parts where I recited this um this profession of faith that Reverend Suji uh, so graciously and generously uh, drafted for our reflection and edification. And at the beginning of Article 1, he says, We affirm our faith in Amida Buddha, whose infinite light of wisdom and compassion shines on all corners of the universe. Well, that may be as far as I get in this particular uh, episode. And, uh, of course, Amida Buddha, Amitabha, Amitayus, Amitabha, infinite light or wisdom, Amitayus, infinite life, available to us for all time as a source of compassion, shines on all corners of the universe, that light, inconceivable, inconceivable, that word. I love that word because it helps us realize that you know, we may think about Amida Buddha in concrete terms, and that's fine and appropriate, and that's the way I think of him most of the time. But at the same time, I recognize at another level, we can't really uh, accurately imagine this Buddha, this cosmic Buddha, in some literal concrete sense at a specific 
location in the universe that can be targeted by a particular telescope or satellite or space probe. You know, and this is going to be perhaps a point of controversy within the context of these podcasts that I do, if I do more of them, is that, um, you know, we can do both at the same time or at different times, depending on our needs at a particular time. We can imagine him as real and there in the universe, but we can also have an appreciation, as Hui Nang would say, is that, um, in a sense, Amida Buddha is within ourselves. It is our own Buddha nature. It is in our own mind. And we are uh, connected with this Buddha. And in that sense, however we may want to consider him, we have to acknowledge in a bottom line sense, he is inconceivable. Concepts, thoughts, words, these things that are created by the mind, which is by definition dualistic, cannot pin down the true nature of this great Buddha whose infinite light of wisdom and compassion shines on all corners of the universe. With that, I will sign off by reciting the Nembutsu in gratitude for being embraced and accepted just as I am by Amida Buddha, never, never to be abandoned. Namo Amida Buts. Namo Amida Buts. Namo Amida Buts.